my, my name is Donald Frazier, and my current position is that I'm a uh, sci emeritus scientist uh, working in tech transfer in the science and technology uh, office. My uh, formal training is that I'm a physical chemist. I have a PhD in physical chemistry from uh, Rutgers. And uh, I've worked uh, uh, in this area throughout my entire uh, career, which actually officially ended in December of 2012. And I came back uh, uh, in retirement uh, to, do, to do this uh, additional uh, work that I'd like to do uh, to help advance uh, technology uh, with HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, and uh, small colleges, and uh, with some advanced uh, technologies. Born in Nashville, but uh, uh, moved to Detroit ultimately after a brief stint in Los Angeles, and uh, grew up in Detroit. And uh, my uh, early years in Detroit were that as a young young boy who, who was just going from day to day and uh, making sure uh, I was getting some of my mom's good cooking and, and uh, trying to do the right things to satisfy my parents and uh, staying out of trouble and uh, sometimes not always successful at that in uh, growing up in Detroit. Um, uh, now, as far as how I, I got interested, and this is this is a story that uh, I like to tell because it really played a little bit of a role in my, uh, my future uh, uh, work, is uh, uh, my parents uh, gave me a chemistry set when I was a, a child, which I really enjoyed. I liked that. They didn't know I was going to like it as much as I did, but I liked doing that, uh, playing with that. And another, the other thing they wanted me to do was burn the trash, and uh, we had alleys in Detroit that uh, uh, was how we got rid of our weekly trash. We didn't have, I don't remember seeing any regular garbage pickups and uh, they might have come in the alley somewhere, some, somewhere along the line, but generally it was us going out and burning the trash and leaving all the ashes back there somewhere. And uh, uh, I was fascinated by, the, by that, by what was going on in a, in a combustion process. I wasn't calling it that then. I, then I was calling it burning the trash. But uh, <clears throat> I came to realize <clears throat> that this was a, a process uh, that required oxygen, and uh, it was uh, combustion, and it had some other meanings to, to it. And I just slowly learned that uh, rusting and corrosion was a similar process, of uh, the same process of oxidation, and except it uh, not as exothermic, it didn't give off the heat, and it was much slower. Uh, and so I said, well, this is something else. And finally, I came to realize that this is relevant to uh, uh, even electrochemistry, which is even more subtle and nuanced, and uh, which, uh, which is not, uh, uh, which, 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 you know, could involve uh, uh, oxygen, uh, but uh, uh, just uh, got me into oxidation reduction processes, which is, is a form of physical chemistry. So I became interested in physical chemistry. Then later on, uh, I, was, I was teaching up in uh, SUNY uh, after I got, before I got my PhD, but, but uh, while I was working on it, I went up to State University of New York at Albany and uh, I got involved in a program which tried to uh, encourage young people to get into uh, chemistry and the sciences. And so this was a STEM, beginning of my interest in STEM uh, and I started thinking about this combustion process that I was uh, involved in as a kid. I said, what if you don't have oxygen, you put heat into it? And so, uh, well, what you have is pyrolysis. And so if you do that, if you take garbage and stuff that's uh, biodegradable and burnable and all that, but you don't, but you exclude oxygen, you can do that using what's called a tube furnace, flow nitrogen over it and just raise the temperature real high those molecules can fly apart and they come back together and form crude oil. And so, uh, and so uh, we started uh, getting kids to doing that up in uh, uh, State University of New York uh, at Albany. And I found out uh, that there is a company 
there was a company, this is back in the 70s, long time ago, called Occidental, who also had that same idea and were <clears throat> converting garbage to oil in that way. And uh, now, you know, you don't get crude oil as it comes out of the ground, but you get certain fractions of crude oil depending on what you burn. So we had students uh, taking the moisture out of garbage, banana peels, you name it, any kind of garbage, grinding it up to make a powder and putting in tube furnaces and uh, uh, taking it up to temperature, uh, absent oxygen, it comes back together, you cool it down, and forms crude oil. And so these are ways, these students became very excited. Now these aren't students that you would normally uh, uh, expect to, to jump on and get into the science field, but the, the idea that they were striking oil from something they were very familiar with was extremely exciting to them. So we started doing other things. By the way, Occidental, I think, did build some plants somewhere in uh, the Soviet uh, Union in Russia. Somehow they got involved with them, and I don't know what the status of that is or not, if, if there's too much energy involved for it to be uh, really an effective way to, to develop uh, oil. And you don't get the same fractions. You get certain fractions depending on what, what, uh, you know, what you start with, what your starting point is. But you might be able to make butane, cigarette lighter fluid. You might be able to make wax, candle wax. You might be able to make some other petroleum products other than uh, gasoline. Well, you might be able to make gasoline if you got the right uh, combination of things. But it's an interesting thing that touches kids uh, and students in general uh, as to, uh, in, into an idea that, uh, uh, that maybe they can do something, they can really think through some things that are familiar to them and come to some, if they have the right training. And so that's where, to me, STEM comes into the picture, into the uh, uh, process, you know, by getting uh, people involved by introducing them to something that is familiar to them. Uh, the other thing that we, uh, and this is not, <laughs> this is typical of anybody, uh, uh, you might, might want to, uh, uh, the other thing, it, it, along those lines, we decided is, yes, what about it, what if we wanted to you have an insecticide? What if we wanted to, not, and, and this is not to say that uh, a certain class of people have roaches or anything, everybody sees a roach every now and then, and, uh, and we know that that's a problem, that's a pesticide, we, uh, we do a lot of development in the, in the industry. Um, uh, what if you uh, got around the immunization process or uh, the, uh, the, the uh, fact that you can uh, uh, spray insects enough so they become immune, future generations become immune, they build up an immunity uh, to, uh, to that particular uh, chemical. Well, what you'd want to do is sterilize them. So we started thinking about uh, uh, attracting them using pheromones, which is a sex attractant, to attract, uh, uh, say, uh, the male to the female, and then uh, doing some chemical synthesis, organic synthesis, synthesizing something. This is all something that teaches, this is part of a STEM process, teach them something that, that would sterilize them, chemosterol, and there were a lot of chemosterilists out that were used on fruit flies and that. So we ended up getting uh, some formulations and the students would get into the lab and make these things. And then uh, we would set up a thing where we would find the female, we'd have to identify the female insect and the male insect, then we'd attract the male insect and uh, uh, then uh, feed them these uh, chemosterilins. Sure enough, there were no future generations. And you're talking about exciting some students. Uh, these, things, uh, these things worked uh, elegantly. Uh, and we were, there were other ideas. We used other, other things with art, and polyurethanes and that sort of thing. So uh, STEM education, I think, uh, is something that needs to uh, uh, at least start with familiarity, something that the students uh, uh, are familiar with. And this is not all students. There are some that are just uh, innately, you know, ready to learn whatever without any kind of stimulant or creativity. But then there's a, a, a large fraction that will learn it if you provide them with the right uh, incentive. And, uh, and I think we need to do more of that. Uh, the biggest part, I think, is uh, a, a thing that limits 
us in, in this whole STEM process is uh, resources, our resources. You know, we don't uh, provide the right uh, amount of resources. I mean, things like I just described still requires somebody to, to do it, someone to teach it, someone to uh, pay for it. Uh, uh, I, think, I think until we are committed to providing the right amount of resources uh, and the right amount of, uh, of direction, uh, the right amount of, uh, uh, of uh, incentives for the students to pick it up, uh, uh, you know, we're going to be fighting these fires, uh, I think, a little bit randomly. I know when I was a kid, um, one of the things, that, well, not when I was a kid, when I was in college, one of the things I understood uh, that uh, uh, separated uh, the teaching curriculums from science curricula or that the education curricula, and this is years ago, and I think they have improved on that by now, uh, the education curricula didn't require science, did require mathematics. So the teachers, the teachers were, uh, uh, who, who, who chose uh, education as their pathway, to, to a degree, were doing it largely because they wanted to avoid science and mathematics. And uh, uh, I, you know, I had a few friends like that, so I know that was the case then. Now, I know that's improved now, but it's just an example of uh, what happens to a student who is being taught by someone who is afraid of the topics, the STEM topics. That, te that student is not going to learn, so you propagate that same fear in the students or aversion to the topic. You know, the student might be ever so inclined to want to learn that topic, but there's no one available uh, to uh, introduce it. So uh, that was then. I think now uh, they've uh, corrected that. But even now, I believe uh, the pay for a, a STEM teacher is probably no better than the pay for any other teacher. And uh, although all teachers are great, don't get me wrong, you know, art, all that is wonderful stuff. It's just that uh, there's a, a, a short change when it comes to uh, STEM education, uh, uh, just naturally. I think that uh, anyone who is knowledgeable about engineering, science, technology, and mathematics is going to migrate, obviously, to the highest paying job. And uh, uh, that's generally the case. There are going to be some that are dedicated uh, and willing to do things uh, out of their own pockets and for free. Though that's a rare, rare individual, uh, uh, laudatory individual, but it's not the mass of masses that we need in order to move uh, STEM education forward. What I'm doing now as an emeritus. Uh, is free of charge. I don't get paid to be an emeritus. Uh, I don't know how many people would, uh, would, would do that. Uh, I'm not saying that there's something special about me, but it's going to require uh, either resources or someone who is saying you don't require, they don't require resources to do it. What we're doing is uh, writing proposals, uh, it is something for his career, uh, trying to get funded to do some forward thinking research, <coughs> what we call low technical readiness level work, low TRL, trying to, uh, and, and, and he has connections in turn. He got his PhD from Vanderbilt, but he also has connections to smaller schools and HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. So he can tie into those. And so what we're trying to do is, is uh, develop a network of uh, small schools, including especially uh, HBCUs and OMUs, uh, other minority universities, uh, Latina, Latino uh, universities, uh, Hispanic, Native American, uh, and to uh, 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 develop work in conjunction with perhaps some of the larger universities like Berkeley, uh, Harvard, uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, uh, to do some low technical readiness levels so that students that need maturing, a time to mature and develop because of this lack of STEM education, they might need a little time. Uh, and hopefully that development and uh, technology development 
can converge at some time in the future, in which at which time we would have a highly educated workforce <coughs> from this particular uh, set of students and technologies. I think if that can be things like that, and that's just one idea, uh, I presented that to uh, Dr. Julian Earls uh, last week, actually, who is the former director of the Glenn Research Center. And uh, he's doing some remarkable things himself uh, as a retired director. He is a product of an HBCU. He came out of Norfolk State University. And uh, he's, uh, he's done many other things since. Uh, he's been through the Harvard Business School and so on. Julian Earls is very well known in uh, physics. And uh, he was, was very supportive of this idea of uh, retirees going back into the, uh, 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 where they came from on some of these, these unpaid positions, such as an emeritus position, uh, and uh, which, you know, that's, you know, I mean, that's, that's not something that's going to be done in a large, by a large number of people, because most people would like to increase their retirement uh, earnings, you know, by doing something they get paid for, compensated for, and uh, not to say that that I wouldn't uh, eventually do that myself, but uh, uh, just just as a possible avenue, uh, getting back and getting some of these young uh, uh, PhDs involved in this, which helps their career, helps them navigate through full cost accounting and line management, because now you've got somebody who is free to go around and develop partnerships uh, within the organizations, uh, within the institution, and uh, among the universities, uh, which you wouldn't normally have that time to do it if you were in an eight to five job and expected to deliver. Uh, for example, if you're on the uh, uh, SSL team, or some team that has deadlines to meet. Uh, there's no time for the person who is working uh, 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 an eight-hour day at, uh, at, in, in his organization to do all of these extra things. And this is what I mean by we have a lack of resources and structure, infrastructure, uh, to really approach STEM on the level that we need to approach it. And so, uh, you know, what I'm doing is, is right now, in this emeritus role that I'm playing is to try to find a process whereby we can, uh, we can uh, uh, encourage uh, certain people to, to come back and mentor, and this is, gets into the mentoring on another, another level, uh, mentor already developed uh, PhDs and people that, that are, uh, are advanced but are constrained by the institutional institution to do these, these things outside of the bounds of uh, what they're expected uh, to do. And, uh, and, and I'm working with a young man, uh, Dr. Enrique Jackson, right now, who is, uh, this is the person I was talking about who has his uh, PhD, who is willing to uh, do, he is very energetic and capable and, uh, 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 and is, is making some of these connections that uh, that uh, I think he had Jackson State up today in a meeting with uh, the folks in uh, Tech Transfer. So uh, this is something that, that needs to be thought about and looked at, not to say that I'm, I'm providing the perfect solution, but uh, uh, at least uh, it should be uh, something that uh, uh, could be discussed and, and, con and, and considered. Um, <clears throat> Most of my teaching was uh, here was at Oakwood. Uh, I had taught uh, physical, I started physical chemistry years ago uh, at Oakwood College. And uh, uh, I mean, you know, at least I had uh, something to do with the start of the physical chemistry at Oakwood College. And uh, uh, that's where I did most of my teaching. Now, at A&M, uh, we, I, along with Dr. Benjamin Penn, another PhD at, uh, he's a polymer chemist at Marshall Space Flight Center, helped develop the physics department at Alabama A&M, uh, which uh, had really rose to become one of the top uh, physics departments uh, at the time in the current country. Even now, they have a uh, uh, Nobel uh, Prize uh, speaker every year come, to come uh, 
call this the Venkatis Warlu, uh, Pucha Venkatis Warlu uh, uh, Nobel uh, Laureate Series. They come once a year to Alabama A&M, somewhere around this time of year, actually, October, November time frame, and give a lecture. <coughs> uh, uh, that department started years ago uh, with, uh, uh, with, with, with our support from Marshall Space Flight Center. And uh, Dr. Benjamin Penn and myself were the ones that uh, did most of, most of that, uh, that work. First of all, I, I started from scratch. And uh, uh, second of all, I couldn't, couldn't do it on Saturdays because it's a seven-day Adventist uh, school. And so uh, I did, I had to do things like develop, set up a laboratory for enough students. There were something like 12 or 13, 14 students. I had to have enough experiments. And I had to write the lecture, do the lectures about, we, we met uh, uh, every week about uh, classes were, uh, Lecture. I had two lectures, about an hour and a half a lecture, I guess. And, uh, uh, and then I had a lab that was about three hours long. And so uh, what I did was I accumulated experiments. Uh, I went over to UAH and got some of their experiments. I went over out to A&M and got some of their experiments and, and put them all together, got my own set of ideas and developed uh, a bunch of experiments that uh, the students had to work their way through. And I get, we got the equipment. We had some equipment. I had some equipment already there. Uh, uh, Dr. Lahing, who was another physical chemist at Oak, he is the main guy there now, or he was. And uh, he had uh, helped with some calorimeters and various th uh, pieces of equipment that uh, uh, were there. And, uh, and we set it up. and. And they did fashion, they did write the, uh, the uh, uh, hours to match my work schedule. And I'd come down after work here at Marshall and, and do the lab, run the lab and uh, teach, do the lectures. And so I did that for about six, seven years at uh, Oakwood. And uh, so that, that was, was a very, very good experience because some of those students uh, 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 became extremely, uh, uh, talented and went on to medical school and uh, uh, one of them didn't like, she found out from me she didn't really like chemistry so she became a lawyer and she became the chief counsel here at Marshall Space Flight Center. Highlighting uh, the idea that uh, you know, you hear about the history of uh, uh, minorities, black folk, you know, being unsuccessful in the sciences and that sort of thing is, is a myth. You know, it's a myth. Uh, I think, I think uh, uh, there are many extremely talented, uh, Charlie Bolden, you know, our, our NASA leader, you know, uh, uh, Ron McNair, you know, who, uh, uh, Guy and Bluford, who's, who, who flew Challenger before Ron McNair flew Challenger. He didn't, didn't blow up on him, but he, in 1983, he was the first uh, black astronaut uh, and uh, 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 did some wonderful things out there. Uh, uh, Carruthers, who, uh, who was the first guy who, who was the guy who, who developed the uh, uh, spect uh, spectrograph that uh, recorded our atomic oxygen around the Earth from the lunar surface. He did all the uh, instrumentation for that. Uh, these are all blacks that, that are uh, extremely gifted and who have come out of uh, 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 similar situations that I came out of. Um, we go all the way back to to uh, you know, what makes anybody successful at what they do, uh, <coughs> uh, you have to go back to familiarity and surroundings, and uh, uh, not innate ability, uh, but surroundings. What is it that they're most familiar with? And uh, you know, we talk about great black athletes and all that. Well, 
when I was a kid, that's all I did was play basketball at, uh, at the playing ground down the street. I couldn't s go swimming because there were no swimming pools, you know. So there's the myth about swimming, you know, black folks can't swim. Now we got an Olympic, we have Olympic uh, swimmers, uh, you know, because now they're exposed to it more. And uh, so exposure is, is what the problem is. And, uh, and, and I, I maintain that if we have the resources, and I keep coming back to resources, and that's why I'm doing this, what I'm doing now with the emeritus thing. I have to consider this, that I'm being a resource. We go back to resources uh, uh, and, go, and funding teachers who, are, who can teach them more than uh, or giving them something that keeps them from going off into engineering fields, uh, help them get into education fields, help make some incentive out of it. And, and uh, they might be more inclined to do that than, than working in a, an organization like Marshall or anywhere else. They might want to work in a school and help students, uh, pay them. And uh, so resources is, uh, is, is the thing that we need to put more into. Uh, it's nothing magical about STEM. We talk about STEM like there's some, something, you know, mysterious. It, you know, it's not, not mysterious, you know. Uh, people used to tell me uh, when I was coming up through sci the sciences, don't take physical chemistry because it's hard. <clears throat> well, I already knew I liked physical chemistry, you know, because of the burning combustion stuff. Yeah, I knew I liked uh, to look at and, and look at oxidation reduction reactions, you know. So why 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 should I avoid it? And uh, but the general feeling is that oh, this is too difficult or this is not something for them. It's like the swimming thing. It's not too difficult to swim. I can't swim because I didn't have a swimming pool. I got one now, but I didn't have one then. And uh, my kids are some of the best swimmers uh, you can find. My kids are. And uh, so, uh, so it's, it's a matter of exposure. And uh, that's what, that's, that's what, what uh, limits us. And then, and then we get tangled up in so much noise, you know, about things that aren't important, uh, that, that aren't correct. Uh, that missed the point, and, uh, and in the meantime, our human resources, which are the African Americans, the Latinos, all these people that, that uh, could be really contributing big time to our, our society, are, are left struggling with things that they don't quite understand because they haven't matured to the point to understand it, and we don't give them the opportunity. And I think the adults need to stop making so much noise that uh, uh, distracts, you know, from what's really important.